Okay. All right. We'll get going and people will share as we go. Like I said, super excited to have you all here. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties. We we had uh, we had Goon post something funny on an Elon thread a couple of weeks ago, and since then Twitter has just not been working the same for us. So I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm not pointing any fingers, but Bluebird and Red Triangle have not been getting along last week, but we're making it work. All right, we're gonna jump in. Uh, like I said, super excited to have the Ava Labs team and Sardis team here today. If you guys haven't checked out the news, Sardis just expanded support uh, for their platform to Avalanche, and we're really excited to help a bunch of game devs accelerate building their projects. And today, uh, to get us kicked off, I want to do a quick intro with the Stardust team. Can, can one of you guys jump up here and kind of talk a bit about what Stardust does? I'll let, I'll let Andy do it. Andy's, Andy does it every day. Andy, you want to go? Nope. I think Andy can't go. Uh, I guess he might have gotten rug. He's been having this problem. I think we had this the other day. Um, so uh, I'll jump in. My name's Atif, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Stardust. I've um, uh, been here about a year and a half. Prior to this, uh, spent uh, about eight years at Facebook and helped build the games business from the ad side. Um, Stardust is uh, essentially an obfuscation layer for uh, developers to build in a simple REST API like they do across a bunch of different tech platforms instead of having to interact directly with the blockchain. Um, and for users, you know, through our custodial uh, wallet and just overall end-to-end -end solution, we make the onboarding of users onto that, you know, Web3 experience or crypto experience easier. Um, the, the thesis is that developers, game developers specifically, should focus really on the thing that they do best, which is making games and uh, allow uh, a technology like Stardust to... Uh, deal with the blockchain. And then from a user's perspective, you know, the thing that I always talk about um, is for Web3 gaming to really take off, we need that Candy Crush moment, right? Where, you know, my grandmother uh, on the other side of the world can play Candy Crush because it's just really easy to, to onboard. And so from our perspective, you know, the complexities of learning like a MetaMask uh, is not kind of what the masses are going to want, especially as, as more traditional and casual gamers uh, come onto the scene. And so um, our focus on that side is really to obfuscate that whole Web3 experience. So that's a little bit about Stardust. Um, you know, we've raised from some really great uh, VC firms like Framework. Um, Michael and Vance are, 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 are great partners, uh, Blockchain Capital, A Crew, uh, Distributed Global. Um, and we work with some of the largest, uh, not only Web2 publishers like Tilting Point Games, but some of the most exciting Web3 publishers or developers like Midnight Society and Block Tackle who's, who's making Skatex. And so uh, there's a bunch of other really great brands, but we can't talk about those. But um, yeah, really excited to work with Avalanche. You know, Ed has been fantastic. Um, he's been chasing us down for a year talking about how special this community is. And so really excited to, to finally be a part of it. And we're, we're super happy to have you. Uh, the, the Avalanche community is indeed special. And as, if you guys have seen some of the recent news, we are absolutely putting our foot on the gas when it comes to the gaming ecosystem. As if you and Andy are new to spaces with me, so uh, I'll, I'll give you guys this. I, I do like to ask the spicy questions and we're gonna jump in right now. The first one is probably one that's on everyone's mind, right? Is why is this text so important? And why or why, why or uh, why not um, should devs be building this stuff in house? Like how, how, how should they be thinking about, you know, when in their development cycle, they should consider maybe working with a partner like Stardust and when is it appropriate for them to be doing this in house? What's your take? Yeah. So, you know, I think for, in terms of like potential partners, like at the very beginning, right, this is infrastructure. And so getting in early is, is really important. When we look at some of the developers that we've been working with, like, United Society and a bunch of others. Um, we've been working with those partners for over 12 months and really being involved as, as they're important, but yeah, because someone that decision up to the end. Uh, this is your question around like this, the, this one, why developers should build this uh, internally uh, or work with a partner like us, you know, <clears throat> There's a lot of pieces to this, right? I think one of the things that we talk about internally is we have this thing called Boomerang because the tech looks so easy that a lot of developers come in. They're like, you know what? I can build a pretty easy wallet solution. Um, I can build the minting stuff and, you know, work on that. But one of the things that we learned with Tilting Point was they actually 
actually have a spreadsheet for us to build this to scale, it would cost us about a million dollars a year uh, and a bunch of overhead and a bunch of uh, developers dedicated. To, uh, to get to where we started 12 months ago. And so the actual dollar perspective, but also from a time perspective, is really, really important. Um, and so Hello, can you hear me? It looks like we may have lost lost Atif a little bit. Atif, did you guys lose me? You, you want to try speaking again? Yeah, can, yeah, we lost you for a second. Yeah, can you guys hear me now? You're sounding good. Okay, cool. Um, and so the the time from a from a money perspective and a and a time perspective, like the cost that you have, it really um, uh, it, it just makes more sense. And then you know the other piece of it is security and compliance, right? Like we are custodial. Uh, and if you look at kind of our thesis, which was different than most people's like 12 to 15 months ago is we're an equity only business. We don't have a token. Um, we've been working on getting our money transmitter licenses for, you know, 15 months. We have five licenses. We have another 10 to 15 by the end of the quarter. And the goal is to have like full transmitter regulatory compliance licensing in the United States by, you know, the end to middle of next year. And, you know, 12, 15 months ago, that was probably not as important a topic. But as we look at what's happened over the last three or four months, if you do work with a custodial solution, and not everybody does, and, and we understand that, like having that regulatory and compliance framework uh, is really, really important for where we think the industry will go on a state by state basis. So, you know, time, money, regulation. Those are the three reasons. The three reasons and compliance. Those are the three, four reasons that uh, we can really help. Um, you know, speed up the process. Andy, I see your hand up. Do you want to add on to that a little bit? It's hard to it's hard to perfect perfection, but um, I'll just add a little bit of color flavor to it. Um, uh, on the BD side, uh, I can't tell you how many conversations I have where they, the CEO or the CTO kind of just like sags their shoulders at the end of the meeting is like, well, I wish we had talked to you six months ago because we built out a bunch of stuff and we can go to market twice as fast now if we just scrap it and use you. But then further, you know, because yeah, earlier is the better. But then uh, sometimes, you know, the cool thing about Web3 Dev is that anyone can just get in and start building and do things on blockchain themselves and and learn, you know, there's lots of tools out there. So a lot of people come to us <clears throat> already having built some, you know, Web3 blockchain aspects to their game. And the cool thing, those are some of my favorite conversations because the nice thing about that is they know exactly uh, in depth the problems that we solve. So they might have a token, which is awesome. And I love that games can have that kind of direct-to-consumer on-chain relationship. And they can con continue to flex that muscle and like maintain that relationship, that user flow. But then they'll use something like Stardust to go ahead and actually scale things on chain. So they can kind of have two parallel flows of what they've already built, um, you know, even if it's far down the line, and then use us to go and hit those millions of users and have the focus for those users be the gameplay. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That. Ed, I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna throw it over to you. You, you come from you know, Web2 Gaming, you've been around the block, you're also talking to game developers every single day. And I think we've had conversations about how game development cycles are really long as it is. You add in Web3 and you start to layer on more time and more cost. Can you can you speak to how what Stardust is building is really important in some of the conversations you're having, especially with traditional, you know, established Web2 developers? Yeah, as, as Altif was saying, you know, we've been talking for a year plus now uh I've spent time with them at their offices we spent a lot of time like over meals and everything and i think what's what's really exciting is that they attack this like back end as a service from a few different areas right so i think the first is when we think about like the ui and ux of of a web3 game at scale i think what is it the recent report was like there was maybe a 800,000 gaming wallets like in all of web3 right and like that number is going to increase significantly this year but, you know, at a baseline, you need to offer at least the same user experience as someone accessing the game from Web2, right? Whether they're downloading on their phone, you know, whether they're downloading the app from Steam or the Epic Game Store, like, you need to be able to, like, hop into the game and get started right away, right? So offering this kind of custodial wallet experience is, like, super important. Like, it's, it's, it's a necessity for the games today. Um, the second piece is also just kind of the scale of NFT minting and the NFT marketplace that they offer, right? So um, let's say, you know, other chains that may not be able to scale as well as Avalanche, like, 
you know, it's very important that, you know, your NFT sales and your drops go really well. And they're just building a really unified experience across the board, similar to how you think about almost like Unity or Unreal or like, you know, Pragma for Web2 gaming. Um, and I think it, it, it fills a really big need in the market. And then beyond that, kind of the team just goes above and beyond with the games. Like they spend a lot of time on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I've seen it myself, some of the games that they've talked to in our ecosystem, even before, you know, they were officially supporting Avalanche. So the team is just all about value add, which like aligns really well with how we think about gaming PD as well. We we add I I literally I want to add so much value I will help change Ed, I will have Ed change diapers uh, like that's how much value we want to add uh, to the ecosystem but like all joking aside one of the key things about our team is is we want to be the nicest most approachable team even if you don't work with us we want to leave the relationship in a good way you might need to work with us in the future but like your interactions with everybody on our team should be like a plus because. That is the most important thing. Like we're all figuring this out together and being transparent, being honest and being great partners is like so important to our go-to-market function. I agree with you. There's never a wrong time to have good vibes. So I'm really glad you guys are approaching it that way. But you mentioned something that I want to double click a little bit into. You said games may need to work with you in the future. What is something that you guys are seeing that is really driving game devs to kind of come in and work with you and how are you guys stacking maybe your different solutions and positioning them for game developers at different stage of, of their development cycle? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think what we're learning is uh, something that like anybody that's been in gaming for a long time knows is that like different developers want different things because they have different genres of games. They have different economies within the games. They have different game design. And so, you know, the products that we're coming out with over the next quarter are really going to uh, like attack that um, and make sure that not only do we have a, an end-to-end -end managed platform for some of the largest developers in the space, but we're also building, you know, more flexible and custom stuff for, you know, Web3 native developers that, um, you know, have their own custom contracts, right? Want to deploy it a certain way, uh, need payments, um, want liquidity on marketplaces, right? And so, you know, we are starting to think that, hey, like from our perspective, we're just going to continue to build what we hear from developers. And I think the thing that's really important that Ed highlighted, and thank you, Ed, for, for highlighting is like the scale piece, right? You know, when you look at like what we were able to do min with Midnight Society, I don't, know if, I don't know if there's any other solutions in the space that are competitive to us. I can say, you know, they were able to, at that time, and we've gotten much faster, up to 25,000 NFTs per hour, right? I think that number is probably two or three X that now based on how we've improved the system. So that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Andy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Just to confirm, the question was where in the dev cycle should people talk to Stardust? That's right. Or, or some of the common needs that you guys are seeing in the market that you're serving. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we already touched kind of like where, you know, the answer is anytime. But as far as common needs, Octave did a good cover there. I think another thing that is great about Stardust is we kind of take a consultative approach. So a lot of people come into the space or they look in a scale of space and they don't exactly know how or they don't have the chops on either side of Web 2, Web 3 when it comes to like a truly scalable game. And that's one of the awesome things about our team is that we've got a background in, you know, you name it. You know, we've got huge players at, at Facebook and, um, and then on the blockchain side too. So we take a very consultative approach where we want to be like the first call when you run into problems. We, we, can, we can, you know, answer pretty much any question and help guide you. We are by no means, you know, telling you what to do, but we're happy to be a sounding board. And we have a huge client success team that's, you know, very active and, and there to make sure that you feel taken care of as a game dev. Yeah, and, and just on the team point, because Andy brought up a great point, like on the tech side, when you look at like our leadership on the tech side, you know, those are actually people that worked at Zynga and at Glue and at EA and have, have, have built games and have built them for scale. Like Martin who runs our, our engineering group and Gordon who runs product, like both have been in games for a decade. And so there is a level of understanding that w when you look at it from that perspective, the, the products that we're building, we're building it from a game developer's perspective. That's awesome. I, I'm starting to I'm starting to understand sort of why why Ed says such great things about Sardis and why we've been pursuing this partnership for so long. Tech and team are also two of the core values that that Avalanche has, right? And so I'm really glad that we shared that. Um, so we talked a bit about team. 
I want to talk a little bit about tech. You guys, you guys said the word scale a couple times, right? Scale is something that that Avalanche is also uh, providing for a lot of game developers. And now that you guys are have been part of the ecosystem for for a little bit now, talk to me about what 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 made you guys expand Avalanche? Like, what were some of the things uh, from a tech perspective that you guys have been keeping your eyes on? Yeah, I think you know. Uh, the two things that I hear from the ecosystem are definitely, you know, the, the team, right? I think we talk about that on that, but the scalability and then, you know, the subnet product, you know, I think when we think about um, developers that had an app chain thesis early on, like getting to that, getting to that market first and then having a fully baked product that is fairly easy to implement, I think is something that developers are pretty excited about. And so that, that, that's the one big thing that I hear uh, on my side. Yeah, to uh, to expand on that, and it's pretty much the same thought, but just in general, kind of, Stardust is built on layer twos because gaming is volume intensive, it's t- tech intensive, and um, we're going to need that space to be able to operate, and that's why we're on layer twos in the first place, and then Avalanche definitely led the charge on, you know, okay, let's scale it again, and that's what gaming will need. So I think everyone wants to, like, gravitate towards a space that is, you know, has an eye towards scaling, and then us at the individual level allows for an individual to scale um, very easily with the simple API. So it's a very natural synergy. I'm sorry to use that word. Oh, thanks for sharing. Um, let's, let's kind of get a little bit uh, zoomed out here. I, I know that you know, both teams here are super involved in Web3 Gaming, and, and I'm curious what games you guys have your eyes on right now. And we've, we talked a lot about scaling. We talked a lot about integrating NFTs. Uh, we talked about development excellence. Like, What are some project teams or games that you guys think are doing that really well? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it would be hard to not talk about Dr. Disrespect doing, you know, dead drop and, and you know, what that's going to be like as far as um, a user onboarding perspective, because he has that massive Web2 audience. So we love the idea that, um, you know, if that goes well, he's going to bring a ton of people into the space. So just in general, we're super excited about that team because they have so much Web2 exposure and they can kind of do a, a lot for what, you know, I would call setting a good example for what a Web3 game should be at scale. Um, you know, I'll let Atif pop in on top of that. The, yeah, no, I like, I, you know, that team is crazy good, right? Like Summit, I've worked with Summit for 10 years, built a bunch of really cool gaming companies. They have the Bungie guys uh, making the game. Um, and then Disrespect is obviously like, I mean, the one thing about them that I thought was really fantastic is their community drops where they give the community NFTs and those people can come in and actually play pieces of the game and give like real time feedback. It, that like is, is really cool. You know, really excited about uh, Shrapnel uh, on Avalanche. Like that team is also fantastic. Game looks really great. Um, a couple other games that I'm really excited about. Um, uh, uh, Pirate Nations, that's a more casual game. Amit, who built Farmville, like, you know, he helped, like, really make social gaming a thing. And his thesis around Ethereum and just, like, uh, blockchain in general is, like, very deep. And so I think he's going to build a casual game that's going to onboard a ton of people. And then, you know, some lesser-known games on our side, like Pixels and the definitely excited about SkateX because, uh, like, I love the Tony Hawk games. And so having a mobile game that's going to be like Tony Hawk uh, that also is Web3 by the Block Tackle team is super exciting. So those are those are a couple of the ones that, that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. Hey, as, as a fellow Meta OG, it warms my heart to, to have you mention Farmville. I, I spent a lot of times collecting pixel cows. So those are those are always good times. And I see you unmuted yourself. What, what games do you have your eyes on right now? Yeah, I think within within our ecosystem, like it's it's going to be really exciting these next like this this quarter and next because we're starting to have like a lot of these games that we've been working really closely with in our ecosystem like start to launch their betas or actually like the full versions and there's just a lot of really cool like web two genre parallels that have a really unique like web three element in them. You know, I can think about like Fableborn, right? The team there, it's like a mobile title that's like. Um, Clash of Clans, base builder meets like Archer Clash. It's a really fun twist on that. We've got the guys at Pulsar who you know very well, Garrison, and and you know it's kind of like this this Web three RTS style. Um, of course, we've got Ascenders like the MMORPG. You know, Atif mentioned um, Shrapnel. Um, you know, we've got Battle for Geostone, which is like a a uh, a MOBA built in Web three with some former pros that are like behind it. And there's a bunch of others that we haven't announced. You know, we've got like 
Metadose. We've got, you know, a bunch of different games that we're excited about. So um, I probably missed a bunch, but, you know, those are some that are top of mind right now as, as I'm thinking about like the, the, the roster that we have this year amongst many others. I love it. There's some amazing titles there. And, and I want to flip it back to sort of the Stardust tech platform right now. So we talked a bit about you know, Web2 developers, developers early in their cycle, right? And I think you know, working with a partner like Stardust makes a ton of sense. You're getting in there, you're helping them develop infrastructure and foundation. What about some of these titles that we've just talked about where they're kind of deep in their development cycle? What are some of the things that Stardust is providing these projects or what are some ways that Stardust is helping these guys accelerate their development even faster? Yeah, so I mean, it really depends on the team and what they're looking to do and what their timelines are. Um, you know, we we do everything from like getting into the weeds with like technical integration support to you know, we don't ever get into you know fundraising games, but we definitely like try to be kind of consultative approach, like I said before, on like the business side of the house and account management. Um, so it really kind of depends, but we, like I said before, love to do it all. I'd love to hear what Atif has to add to that. Yeah, I think one of the things back to the point that Andy made earlier about being consultative is like, it's really important to understand the the business, right? Like, what is that developer trying to accomplish? What's the game? What's the genre? What's the audience that they're going after? How are they thinking about like tokenomics, NFTs? Um, you know, I think from our perspective, <clears throat> it really varies from developer to developer, but getting in deep and understanding how our technology can actually help accelerate their business on a case by case basis, as Andy said earlier, is kind of what we what really differentiates us. And so when we think about our team and we look at, you know, one of the things that we try to um, really hammer home and Andy kind of talked about is like our sales team is never going to be big. We're going to build a lot of process out again. You know, you, you said meta OG, like we're going to learn how to you know service millions of clients uh, with a few people. And that, that is our goal. Right where we're going to invest in the business is really on the client success side and the solutions engineering side. When we look at the, the gaps uh, from blockchain to blockchain, the number one thing that we see is that uh, these blockchains do a great job of signing developers up, putting a tweet out, a press release, and then it's really difficult for developers to actually get a hold of those blockchains. And that's an area that we feel like we can really fill the gap. And that's only going to work if we go really, really deep with each developer. Um, and so that's kind of how we're thinking about like our tech. I wish there was like a, I wish there was like a one size fits all, but game developers are so different. They have such different needs that it's really important for us to understand their business. That's one. I love that. I, oh, go for it, Andy. Sorry. No, no. I, I, all I was going to say at the end there was a, that's one of the cool things about being such a like high level abstraction, uh, block, you know, back end for these games is that anyone can show up to us with any idea on any platform and as long as it connects to the internet, we can we can do something with it on blockchain. So it's very fun to be talking to, you know, truly, you, you name it, uh, A to Z developers. Yeah, the, the other thing is, like, like, nobody's got this figured out. Like, you know, and it's, it's pretty interesting as somebody that spent 10 years in gaming to come into, uh, you know, a new uh, era of gaming and see a bunch of people at, like, in high up jobs talking about a bunch of stuff that, like, we don't, we haven't figured this out. The key for everybody is going to be having really that like, you know, clash of clans, uh, candy crush, angry birds moment where one developer proves it at scale and then other people start following fast. And so um, that's why it's like, it's really, it's really important for us to be honest that we are all figuring this out together. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's the most exciting piece about the Web3 space is, not only do we not have the answers, I think a lot of us are still trying to figure out what the problems are. And that provides a lot of surface area for innovation. As we get into the second half of the spaces, if anyone in the crowd is, is a developer or building their own project, we'd love to pull you up here. Up here, So feel free to hit that uh, speaker request button and we'll, we'll get you up here to talk, talk to us. The next topic, I think I want to zoom out a little bit. And you guys mentioned sort of, we're still figuring this out. We're still partnering together. There's a lot that we don't know. And one topic that I think is on every developer's mind, whether you're building a game or building another protocol or project is when you should be you know, adding additional resources to building something ground up or when you should be looking to partner with an outside firm or outside service or outside tech platform. As builders yourself, um, and Ed, you know, as someone who talks to a ton of gaming projects, 
you guys want to share some some insight or some advice on how game developers and founders can assess whether or not something should be done internally or externally? I think, you know, what, what we see is that a lot of, oftentimes, you know, these the Web3 games specifically that we talk to, like they raise with a razor thin uh, room for error padded into to their operations, right? And when we look at traditional like massive Web2 publishers, they've got a lot baked in for these resources and a gating system. And a lot of times things don't make it past the early gates and they go back and they, they rebuild things. But I think for, you know, like I said, in Web3, oftentimes these teams are raising on exactly what they need to build, getting everything right off the bat. So I think it depends on, you know, the funding, it depends on the vision, it depends on the strategy. But oftentimes, you know, um, some of these things like building out the NFT minting mechanism or like the custodial wallets can take a lot more than they think it will. And if they can bring in a third party solution like a Stardust that helps them a lot and speeds along that process, um, and gets them focused on what they do best, which is building the game. It makes a lot of sense, right? Um, there's other er there's other times that it may make a lot of sense that you might need some custom tooling or some things outside of the box that maybe you do consider bringing that in house. So it really depends on a case by case basis. That's a good insight. Stardust team, or again, if, if there are any uh, game builders out there that want to give your opinion as you guys have been building games, please hit that request button. Yeah, this is one of my favorite uh, my favorite kind of topics to talk about with game developers, and I hit on this earlier. But you know, if I were building a game, I would build a little bit in house, and then I would use something like Stardust to scale. So I, I kind of the way I describe it is there's like a top of funnel and a bottom of funnel, and the top of funnel is all of your Web two gamers, free to play. They don't know, they don't care, they might hate crypto, um, but either way, they're there to play your game, and you never want to get those people, you know, have them people, those people turn away because they see a MetaMask pop-up or something that's right right in the beginning of the user flow, and so if you can have a beautiful UX and have great IP, then that's the focus. That's the focus for all those users, and it's fun, and you can, you know, get profit off of them and, and grow your community with them, and all that's great normal gaming sort of stuff, and then <clears throat> meanwhile, though, you can, if you do it correctly, bring those users on a journey of, you know, getting into crypto and, and understanding what NFTs are and blockchain. And that's kind of a where were you moment. You know, where were you when you learned about what blockchain even is? And you could say it was inside of the XYZ IP. And that's really, really powerful. They'll never forget that journey. And so you can take them on that journey. And then if you do it correctly, having your own built out Web3 native uh, kind of user flow, you know, maybe tucked away in the back, then you can con continue to like benefit off of having that direct to consumer uh, blockchain kind of tether. You can always reach out directly to them. You don't have to go through a Stardust to even do that. So if I were building a game, and that's one of the beautiful things about this is you can have a parallel flow and kind of bring them, drag them towards you with the crypto aspect of it, but you keep it tucked away in the back by using Stardust for those users who actually care about the blockchain stuff. Professor, Professor Adams right there. <laughs> yeah, that was good insight, Andy. All right, we can't we can't have a gaming Web three spaces without talking about hating NFTs and the whole Web two. Not at all. Hot yeah, takes, anyone? <clears throat> well, I don't know if it's a hot take, but like you gotta make the game fun. Uh, people gotta want to play the game. Also, like it would be really great, like uh, if it just was a part of the game plan. It wasn't something that was called out. I mean, one of my favorite, like uh, one of my favorite statistics from the mobile era from like the last decade was that um, like 30 or 40% of Android users, they didn't even know that they were, uh, uh, they were using an Android phone. Right. And so, you know, how many w remember when mobile gaming came out and everybody was like, this is terrible. It's not high quality, you know, don't want to do it. Mobile gaming is now a majority of, of revenue from gaming, and most people love that, right? And so you, know, you got to make fun, immersive experiences that people want to come back to. Games, we've been all been playing games since we were kids, and the only reason we keep playing the game is because we enjoy it, right? And that is so, so important. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Game actually has to be fun. And, and when we think about the games that are going to tip the scale here, you know, Stardust team, you guys probably have a really good uh, purview of this because you talk to a lot of existing native Web3 developers as well as Web2 projects that are trying to break into Web3. 
which side do you think is more traction? You think it's going to be these ma major publishers like like Blizzard, Square Enix, Zynga that that kind of make this shift, or do you think it's going to be some some studio or publisher that's native to Web three that we may not have heard yet have heard of yet? <laughs> Atif and I are going mute. I'm mute. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was like at the same time too. It was impressive. I'll, I'll let you follow up to me because I just have a, a thought on it, but I think you're gonna have a better. Uh, logical thought so my, my my kind of more artistic take on that is it's going to depend on depend on who's paying attention and when uh, what i mean is like it'll be beauties in the eye of the beholder so i think that people who are really paying attention might see a web3 native team quote unquote do it but when we take a step back and like history remembers the victors right i think that we're going to have um, the, the larger studios are going to have a massive last mover advantage. There's so much, like we said before, where there's so much that we don't know. There's so much that we don't know what's going to work or if it's going to totally fail. Um, there's all sorts of, we could get into kind of like game loop and what's going to be tokenized discussion. So I think that eventually a larger studio is going to come in with an insane last mover advantage with a lot of things figured out already, including user acquisition, which I think Web3 Gaming in general is kind of sleeping on at the moment. And they're going to come in and quote unquote, do it. So it depends on who is saying that, you know, who did it, I guess, is my thought. It'll maybe, you know, at long after it'll be the big developer because they're big. But I think that probably a Web3 native and indie team will be the first to quote unquote, do it in the way that we feel is, you know, good. I, I want to go back to like uh, your question, Garrison, around like, how do we solve some of the stigma that gamers have towards NFTs and Web3? I think number one, like we move away from calling them NFTs because I don't even know what NFT necessarily means now. Like everything is an NFT these days, right? I think the other thing that we look at specifically, like mainly within gaming, but also like PFPs and other projects as well, is like game developers have, the early Web3 game developers have done themselves a huge disservice for like the whole market by how they've treated customers and nfts right like for the early days it's been let's let's be honest like it's been a way to raise non-dilutive funding because they they sell an nft collection like way before the game is ready right and oh great it's a bunch of money for us to go build stuff but if they don't deliver on that right or they don't like add value to that then people are going to get burned and not want to do it ever again right so um, now we're starting to see like a lot more of these games that are thinking you know about the long tail so it's like okay Let's follow like what's worked in web two, like free to play games where you don't need a digital collectible to play. You look at Counter-Strike, you look at League, you look at a lot of these games that are very like, th these are all cosmetics, right? So if you, if you make it fun and you make it unique and you, in, in, you know, you build a, a f underlying game beneath that, that anybody can play. I think that's the way for us to like kind of um, make NFTs great again, if you will. Oh boy. Um, I, uh, I like to your last question that, that Andy talked about, uh, the, uh, I, I agree with Ed, by the way, like the marketing in this space is it's getting better. Right. Uh, and we need to continue to improve that. We have to speak to, we have to speak to potential users the way they want to be spoken to, not the way that we think that we should speak to them. Um, you know, in terms of like, who's going to win in web three to your original question, Garrison, that you asked Andy, um, you know, it's interesting, right? If you look at the history of gaming, typically incumbents have not innovated, right? They're, you know, if you look at the companies from 30, 40 years ago, they're outside of EA and Nintendo, mainly just Nintendo, they're kind of a shell of themselves. But what's interesting about Web3 is that a lot of these incumbents learned from their mistake when mobile came out because they were very dismissive about it. And now they are all like kicking the tires on Web3. And I think to Andy's point, like they're really going to have that last mover advantage. Like we obviously are working with Tilting Point. We're working with another really large uh, developer and like they're all kicking the tires. You saw what Voodoo came out with uh, and a bunch of others. And what's exciting is that regardless of who wins, the new Web3 native developers that we all kind of said are some of our favorite games are the ones that are going to push the innovation. And regardless of who wins, we're all going to be better gamers for it, basically. So what I'm hearing is, is you, you guys don't think that, you know, we're losing anything as, as a Web3 developer community by maybe letting some of these bigger established players enter into the Web3 gaming space, right? Like, you, you don't feel like that's a disadvantage for us. It's, it's all a net positive. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, listen, the more, uh, you know, the more intelligent, smart minds that are excited about building really great games to come into the market, the, the more the more likelihood of everybody winning. Right. Like this is not a this is not a um, you only you win if I win. If we all do this right, if all the blockchains execute well, if all the middleware providers execute well, all the game developers build great games and bring on a, a billions of users like this industry will do well and we will all have a lot of fun. Right. I think it's like a, every all all C's have to rise together. I love I love the optimism. All right. I'm going to follow that up with a with, with a spicy question and then we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit again. Uh, as, as we all know, a lot of the traditional game developers in the space have not always been really good actors, right? Like we 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 saw the the challenge with with Star Wars Battlefront, where where they sold uh, early access and they never really delivered the product that they want that we wanted. We've seen the whole loot box situation as a way to monetize um, players and you know to, to drive more revenue for these for these businesses. How do we make sure that? the Blizzard Activisions of the world, right? Like the Titans in the industry don't make those same mistakes or abuse the Web3 community once they enter into blockchain. Uh, I'll, I'll come from like a Web2 publisher perspective. Like, first of all, in EA's defense, Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront ended up being a very good game. It's just that whole, you know, most downvoted Reddit, Reddit comment in history just really... You know, set forty thousand dollars for Darth Vader skin Could is it? not the move. Yeah, yeah. full stop. Again, I'm not the I'm just, I'm just he was before his time. The game was good. Uh, to, I, I was actually there when, when that happened. But um, uh, in, in terms of your question around how do we how do we defend against like the the big publishers coming in and not taking advantage of the Web three community? Like, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily like the best question to ask right now because I think right now, even in Web three gaming, with our kind of indie and, and smaller community, like we're also defending against bad actors as well, right? So it's not like we're we're the knights in shining armor defending the world against, against you know, evil. Um, I think the other thing to realize is like these big publishers, like if and when they do move in, um, you know, they're gonna be very methodical about doing this, right? The, the major publishers, uh, their, their top line revenues are in the billions of dollars, right? And so if they move in, they're, they're gonna build something I would hope, you know, for the long tail and, and, and really kind of put the thought and, and effort into it to to do something big here. And we've, we've spoken with other publishers, too, that were pretty hot on Web3 and then, you know, things like FTX and the bear market and, and all that stuff happened. And they kind of pulled back, which I, I don't necessarily think is a bad thing, again, because if you're going to build something in here, you got to commit like the budget. you got to commit the timeline, the effort, the marketing efforts. And we don't want, you know. Uh, a, a drive-by, if you will, of like popping your head in the space and then leaving, which is net more negative than just not entering yet. Couldn't agree more. All right, uh, we're, we're entering into the last 15 minutes of our spaces here. So if any game developers or if any people from the audience want to jump up and ask a question or give some commentary, feel free to hit that request button and we'll pull you up. Uh, I'd love to switch gears here and talk a bit about the partnership program that we've developed where uh, Ava Labs and Stardust have, have put together this accelerator program to help game developers build their projects. And I know that you're super careful about you know, where, where you spend your time and your money. Can you talk a little bit about why this partnership and accelerator program are so important to the ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, look, we've, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about why this might make sense for game developers to leverage like technology like Stardust, right? They're, at the end of the day, there is also a there is a cost either way, right? Whether you're hiring the team in house and building that all up front, and then you know dealing with the, the the headaches around building rolling out your own infrastructure, right? Or it's you know you you leverage someone like Stardust with a lot of help and support, but yeah, there is a cost to it as well, right? So you know the way we think about things is like we want our games to have the best tooling and infrastructure in their hands. How do we make that a more seamless transition to try this out and not, you know, need to necessarily worry about um, the costs around that because, you know, we're all pretty mindful about that. So, you know, the accelerator program that we have basically allows us to um, offer Stardust credits uh, to different games that are building on Avalanche. We'd like to use Stardust um, and you get to leverage all the things that Atif and Andy have talked about in terms of what makes Stardust great, right? NFT minting infrastructure, um, the custodial wallets, the other tools they have coming out you know their team um Atif will probably give you his phone number so you can call him any time of the day um but all these all things, day every day all day yeah, every exactly. day i'm always accessible if you want to talk about 
sports, he's also uh, available. But, um, you know, again, we want to make it as easy as possible to, to, to leverage these types of tools that we think are kind of best in class. And we just think that this accelerator program can, can help a lot. And this, this is also retroactive too, right? So if we've got games who are building, who have already built or, or are thinking about moving to this type of infrastructure, get in touch with us and we can put you in touch with the Stardust team as well. Yeah, you know, um, and I'd love to have like George maybe come up, our head of BD who's in the background there and talk a little bit, but think of this really like uh, AWS credits. We want to prove that we add value to you. We'll give you a bunch of Stardust credits to test out the system and prove that Avalanche plus Stardust is amazing and uh, it will help you get going. That's awesome. Um, all right, I see we've got a couple people who've requested. I'm going to pull you guys up one at a time to ask questions. Juan, you're going to go first. Super great to have you join us. You want to hit me with a quick mic check? Yo, yo. All right, sir. Floor is yours. Thank you so much. I think the conversation has been great. Um, I'm working with ReNFT. We're a, a rental-based protocol. Also live on uh, Avalanche, we were able to help Castle Crush get their rentals going. Wanted to see what your, your thoughts are on rentals. Uh, we've been talking to a couple of people working with you, Stardust, and because it's a centralized solution, we would have to go through you to enable rentals for them. Um, is there kind of just wanted to hear in general, like how you think about rentals? And again, thanks for the discussion on kind of moving forward in, in Web3. And it's great to see Avalanche also up here. Yeah, uh, as Ed said, I will get your contact information and we can chat. Uh, I think from our perspective, like as we think about building out just products or features, within our system or partnering with other solutions like you, at the end of the day, the, the mechanisms that are going to increase the LTV of a user and help developers make more money is, is what we want to build, right? Or, or partner with. And so that is like the core thing, right? It's like the more money we make them, the more value they see in us and our partner products. So that that's how, that's how I would think about it. Yeah. And then on the actual kind of, um, rental, you know, application logic side of things. There are kind of two schools of thought. There's kind of the on-chain logic, and then there's kind of the decentral, I mean, the centralized kind of game logic. And what we do really, really well is allow for game developers to just settle on-chain. So we are right, right now not a logic layer. We just um, settle everything on-chain. So you could build whatever complex um, game mechanisms you want, including renting, and you can set up escrow, custodial wallets, et cetera, and just settle everything on chain for the uh, for the users, um, which is very easy. And any any game dev, app dev, web dev can do that um, very quickly, which is the beautiful thing. And then we're also rolling out, but we're, you know, as we onboard people to Web three, we have an eye towards kind of catering to the Web three, uh, you know, more and more Web three natives, and and that's going to look like um, API calls where you can. Uh, this is what we're building right now, where we can build uh, or or call. With, through the API, call a smart contract, a specific method in the smart contract. So you can go build your own renting or you know interact with another renting protocol on behalf of your user's custodial wallets through the API. Andy, quick, quick, quick plug here for you guys. If there are partners or gaming projects that are looking to learn more about Stardust, what's the best place for them to get in contact well, with Well, at the top of my profile page, there's a little envelope button, which is a DM. That's the best place. But then the second best place would be to go to our website and there's a little form you fill out and, and we uh, we will uh, take it from there. No, 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 no worries. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all of, uh, all the DMs are open. Um, I'm just AtifCon31 at, at everything. So on Twitter, on Telegram, ATIF at stardust.gg, like feel free to ping us and we'll make sure we route it to the right person. Like, and you will be surprised to Ed's point how quickly we respond. All right. And, and Ed, can you say it one more time for the people in the back? If, if folks want to participate in the accelerator program and access those Stardust credits, how should they get in touch with your team or with the Stardust team? Yeah, you can you can reach out to me directly. Um, any of the other gaming folks that you see hanging out on the gaming on AVEX, like Twitter handle, or any of the Stardust team, we we talk very regularly. So you know, reaching one of us will will, will get to the whole group. Awesome. And and for those who for those of us who are keeping an eye on the super exciting kind of conference events track for twenty twenty three, Stardust, what where where can we find you guys in person? Where are you guys going to be this year? 
Yeah, uh, gamer focused events. I think we spent a lot of time at crypto focused events last year, um, and we want to be where game developers are. So I can tell you, um, we're definitely going to be at Dice uh, in Vegas uh, next month. We're going to Pocket Gamer London this weekend. So if you're going to be in London, hit us up. We're doing a dope dinner on Sunday night. We got like 40 people, all great folks, all in Web three, uh, all gaming people. Um, we're going to be at Dice. We got a couple folks coming out there. And then GDC. GDC is our Super Bowl because we're from, uh, you know, in the Bay Area. So we're going to have a meeting space. It's going to have a coffee bar. You can come hang, ch- chat with the team, learn more. And then we throw a big, big, big party. Uh, 500 people at Spin. There's going to be another tournament, ping pong tournament, uh, gaming tournament with a bunch of really cool games. Uh, some of them will be from Avalanche and other chains where you actually get to start playing these Web3 games. And then if you so choose, you can be, uh, you can come with us to the after party, but I am a dangerous person at the bar. So you just have to be ready for that. And, and, and Atif, this might be a bit of uh, events alpha, and I don't know if you can share more about this, but but I hear there's going to be a really great themed activation at GDC this year that you guys are hosting. Is there anything that you can share about that? Um. I think the you know we'll 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 I'll tell you the titles of of our our uh, our lounge where we'll have meetings will be Stardust Cantina like the Star, Star Wars Cantina and then I, I can't ruin the uh, party because if I do Jared is on here and Jared will kill me so uh, but we are we're we're gonna do some really really cool stuff and um, really excited uh, to do that and then the big other event that I'll call out in the summer uh, we'll be at we'll be at the Avalanche Summit in Barcelona so. Would love to meet anybody and everybody that will be out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm personally super biased. I'm excited for Barcelona. I'm super excited for our summit. But after hearing Jared's plan for GDC and what you guys are doing after the show, uh, that that is a very, very close number two. So if anyone is listening and you guys are going to be out in San Francisco towards the end of March, I highly recommend uh, letting either of our teams know that you're going to be here because there's some really, really cool stuff the Starbucks team is planning. Yep. We've got a few yep. minutes left here. Um, do we have any other questions in the crowd? Feel free to request to speak uh, if you want to talk to the Sardis team or talk to the Ava Labs gaming team. But in the time that we have left, like let's let's keep it a little bit casual. Uh, Ed, what games do you have your eye on right now that you're just playing like for yourself? Could be Web 3, could be Web 2. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I play a lot of casual games uh, because my attention span is pretty shot these days and with the kid and everything. So I play a lot, a lot of Royal Match and Marble Snap. Um, and then on the Web3 side, I actually just applied for the Rainy Alpha, um, a card game coming to Avalanche. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then I know we've got this Meta Ops 2v2 tournament coming up. Um, and so, you know, that's a first person shooter that is, is going to be supporting Avalanche and, uh, a lot of people are talking smack in my DMs and on on the Twitter timeline. So I feel like I've got to dust off the mouse and, uh, and 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 see what I still got. If you guys have not registered for this prize pool on on Meta Ops this weekend, you got to do it. Five hundred dollar prize pool. There's a there's an APAC based tournament out of Singapore, and then a North America tournament based out of the uh, I think the western side of the United States, just for ping purposes. But if you're playing in the NA1, Coop and I are going to be uh, sweeping, so get ready for that. And I played Lords of Light last night for the first time. That's the that's the TCG uh, game from Rainy Studios, and I have to say, it's fucking awesome. So if you haven't tried that, I would absolutely reach out to the team to get whitelisted. That game is, is super fun. It's like fully built and extremely well balanced. And there's also this really awesome Elon Musk character that you can play. I highly recommend. Atif, what do you have your eye on as far as games? Um, the the two that I'm I, I like Pixels Online is a game that we work with. That's a desktop game. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then Pirate Nations. Uh, Pirate Nations is a game. Again, I talked about earlier. Um, I, I, I like builder games, so play a lot of builder games, civilizations, age of empires kind of stuff. And so I, uh, those are, those are the ones I focus on. And then, you know, I'm an old man, so I like, I like, uh, word puzzle games too. So th- those are kind of just web two games I'm playing. I, I want to see your Wordle score out to one of these days. We'll, we'll have to, we'll have to hang. Andy, what are you, what are you playing? I love, uh, the idea of talking about 
playable games. That was something last year that was basically non-existent. So it's fun to be able to talk about it. Um, I got to give a shout out to Life Force Games. Uh, they they're working with us. Uh, awesome team. They're hooked into like Ready Player DAO and all that stuff. Um, but they had a public playable uh, recently, and and I spent a lot of time trying to get the high score there. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And then you know a game that we're not working with, but an awesome team behind it is Kaiju Cards. Um, they also had a public playable that was a lot of fun. Spent a lot of time doing that as well. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Uh, we've got one last speaker up here. Vlad, thanks for volunteering to ask a question or share some thoughts. The floor is yours, man. Hello. Uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, I like the topics you are discussing on this space. Um, I noticed that you kept collecting uh, ideas of how to motivate and also get game developers to develop new games on Avalanche and how the UX uh, should be similar to the Web2 games so new gamers would feel satisfied with their project just, uh, just as uh, on the Web2 games. I was actually wondering if you plan on uh, getting other already existing games that are well known to transfer on Avalanche, on Avalanche so that you have already a big audience taking a look at Avalanche, which could get viral and spread across many other gamers instead of developing uh, new games? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a great idea. So I think one, one example of, of, of something just like that is we actually, you know, partnered with Wildlife Studios. You know, they're a top 10 mobile publisher and, you know, they, uh, they have a game called Castle Crush where they've got an existing Web2 player base and, and they integrated kind of Avalanche NFTs into that. Um, there's a few other kind of projects we're talking to both in Web3 and Web2 that are thinking similarly. Um, I think in the kind of near to midterm, that's probably where a lot of this, you know, uh, player Web3 player base is going to grow. But I think for the long tail, it's going to be these, you know, um, unique, like, built from the bottom up like web three studios that are thinking about it in a really like fresh innovative way um like some of the games we talked about today um that are really going to kind of drive the the long tail and, and, and the significant growth of of the player base to get to where we all think it can um i would like to ask uh, if this uh space will be uh posted so i can uh listen to it again because i wasn't uh, at the beginning here Absolutely. It'll be recorded and posted on all of our channels. So feel free to tune in afterwards as well. All right. Thank you. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to send us off with a couple minutes left, get you guys all uh, ready for your next meetings or your calls or wherever you were going. If you guys weren't around for the beginning, we talked a bit about the Stardust Avalanche partnership. If you're a game developer, make sure to reach out to the Ava Labs team or to reach out to Stardust directly to find out how you can get involved and use their platform. And if you're an Avalanche game developer, make sure to find out how you can get credits towards working with Stardust to develop your game. And I really appreciate you guys all for joining today. Atif, Andy, Ed, thanks for giving us your time. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your insights. And we're really looking forward to building games with everyone together. Have a great day. Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everybody.